All right, chapter 34, head and spine trauma. All right, so we understand we have the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system is housed or protected by the skull and the spinal column through the spinal canal that runs down between the vertebrae or in the middle of the vertebrae. And then your peripheral nerves exit through holes called foramens in the cranium and through the nerve pathways between each of your vertebrae. Of course, spinal cord injuries and head trauma are your major concerns. Um, due to the structure of the spinal column, it's rare for the vertebrae to be uh, directly fractured. It's normally something to do with the disc, although the spiniest processes on the vertebrae, the vertebrae could be uh, injured. And we'll see some of that. The scalp is often considered to be some of the thinner skin in the body. However, you do have muscles under your scalp um, that run, uh, control things like facial expressions, eyelids, um, play a role in jaw movement, um, and things along those lines. So, um, Total, the skull is made up of 28 bones. We talked about the 14 bones before. Those were the 14 facial bones. 28 total when you consider all the internal skull bones and such like that, um, and as well as the auditory oscills, because there's six of those. Um, so, all right, what do we need to know about the skull, all right? It actually plays a role in blood production. But its primary function is to protect the brain, as you can see, and we'll see here. So we saw this picture already of the um, uh, skull from the front view, but now you can see it from underneath, and you can see where the occipital bone is, and you see the palatine bones. These are the top of the mouth, um, so the base of the nose, top of the mouth, and that's what we're looking at there. Here's the inside of the cranial vault. This is the picture that I was looking for earlier that I thought was there, forgot which slideshow it was in. So you can see the crystal galley in the middle of the cribriform plate. The crystal galley is actually the top of the uh, vulmar bone and the ethmoid bone that kind of connect together there. And that's that middle bone that divides your nose and goes up into your skull. So if you recall back in the 80s and 90s, the idea that, you know, you could kill a man, you know, we always talked about in elementary school and middle school, it's like, yeah, you can get killed if you get punched in the nose, just right, you could drive that bone all the way up into their brain. Well, actually, that's the bone, it's the vulmar bone, the crystal galley is the part that would actually... Um, cause the trauma and it is possible because of the cribriform plate being perforated a upward blow to the nose in this direction could fracture the vulmar bone and the ethmoid bone and drive it straight up into the um, brain now it happens to be positioned directly in between the two hemispheres of the cerebrum so it's very possible the bone will go up into the frontal lobes or be actually between the two frontal lobes and really not cause any damage or significance. I'm sure it would hurt, I'm sure, doubt it would be pleasant at all, but it is possible that a person could get hit like with a airbag coming up or something like that if they're sitting too close to the steering wheel and it blows up in their face, it could um, fracture that bone. All right, so here's the exterior base of the skull, um, showing the back of the mouth, the oral uh, pharynx. You can see the palatine bone with all of those horn looking structures at it. That's where the soft palate attaches, your uvula hangs there, um, and so on and so forth, uh, connecting down, uh, running down towards the trachea. All right, so one thing I wanna point out on this picture, and I know you guys can't see my cursor, but notice at the very base of the cerebrum, right above the um, orbits, you can see that white, um, looks like two lines, double layers. And uh, Up at the very top of the skull, it's called the meninges. And if you follow the meninges down and around, you'll see the pituitary gland. 
at the base of the hypothalamus, and then it uh, right in front of the pituitary gland, it ends. But then if you follow it the other way, across the top of the cerebrum, down along the back side of the skull, um, and then it note, you'll note that it folds between the cerebellum and the cerebrum and ends right by the penile gland or at the very posterior portion of the corpus callosum. Because we're looking at a lateral cross-section of the brain, uh, the, you, you, it's easy to forget that those meninges, which are wrapping across the top of the head, down the side of the skull, and they're all coming together to create a ring or an opening that surrounds the brainstem. So the brainstem passes through the meninges up into where um, so the cerebrum and the midbrain, or not the midbrain, well, yeah, the midbrain, excuse me, the midbrain and all that is. That circular hole, that or that structure formed by the folds of the meninges is called the tentorum. It's unique, and I bring it up because we've probably heard that your pupils will dilate. One will be constricted, and the other will be dilated when you have major head trauma and interior, or intracranial hemorrhage. And it's because the brain is putting pressure, is pressure is being placed on the optic nerve, causing the nerve to dilate the pupil. And it's because the brain is being forced out of the brainstem. It's not actually the case. In extreme cases of intracranial pressure, it is possible for the pressure to try to force the brain through the foramen magnum and down the spinal cord, but it's actually really not that common. Most of the time, what you're seeing is the pressure of the frontal lobe on the optic nerve at the point of the tentorum because the optic nerve is below the tentorum, below the meninges, and runs back up into the brain. It ducasates uh, right there by the um, hypothalamus, meaning it crosses. But where it passes through the meninges there, that's where the pressure gets applied to the optic nerve. And so it's actually the brain pushing against the meninges that's causing the dilation of the pupils and not the brain being squeezed out of the bottom of the skull through the foramen magnum. So here's your lobes. Why are these important to understand? Well, to be able to predict the type of injuries and expect um, based on the way the patient is either presenting or based on where the trauma uh, took place. For example, if a person has trauma to the back of the head, specifically the lower portion of the back of the head, the occipital region, they're likely to have vision disturbances or loss of vision, likely temporary. Temporal lobe, hearing, reading, things like that. Up here in the middle of the brain, between the parietal and the frontal region, you're going to have your primary motor and uh, primary sensory area. So if a patient is suddenly unable to move a portion of their body, it is likely to be related to that primary motor area. Conscious thought, personality, perception, and things like that, memories, they're all in the frontal lobe. So trauma there is going to have a significant impact on their personality. Patients who uh, are suddenly unable to remember or recognize the presence of their their body. Maybe they're walking and they'll just like walk into walls or smack their arm against a door frame. Or I've seen it where you have um, non-purposeful movement or neglect. You know, the, their arm will just hang randomly off the stretcher in an uncomfortable manner. Or I've seen it where they're like they stick their arm straight up in the air or something like that. They have no idea their arm is there, what it's doing because of damage or injury to the um, parietal lobe where body awareness and such like that um, is controlled. All right, so the cerebellum, sometimes called the athlete's brain, is the very base of the brain. We saw it on the previous picture back here. kind of looks like that cauliflower-looking structure behind the brain stem. This plays a big role in muscle memory. Um, while your, um, your frontal lobe and your pro um, prefrontal cortex and um, handles a lot of your motor, your motor cortex and your motor functions throughout your body, the cerebellum plays a big role in the ability to remember muscle movements and fine tune those muscle movements, maintaining posture, maintaining equilibrium, knowing that you're not falling over, uh, maintaining balance. A lot of that is processed in the cerebellum. Okay, brainstem, basically nearly any 
any organism that has a central nervous system is going to have a brainstem to some extent because this is where the functions of life happen. This is where respiratory control comes from. This is where um, blood pressure monitoring and control comes from. Uh, so uh, a lot of your hormone controls are uh, regulated through the brainstem or are directly sensed through the brainstem. So the brainstem is basically your essential functions for life. Here's a nice little cross section of the skull um, indicate, or, and the brain so we can see the outer skin, fascia, and muscle followed by the skull. Remember this is hollow bone so it's got the um, spongy bone in the middle that is able to um, produce red blood cells and such like that so hematopoiesis. Then you have the dura matter separated from the uh, pia matter with the arachnoid membrane. The arachnoid membrane is that cavernous looking columns or webbing uh, where the cerebral spinal, spinal fluid flows. So there, and it kind of works like a spongy shock absorber between the brain and the skull. And now if you're trying to remember your dura matter and your pia matter, the dura is the durable outer liner, where the pia matter is very thin. Pia matter is actually so thin, it, it's thinner than most tissue papers. Um, very fragile and directly uh, adjacent to the gray matter of the brain. And you can see there's blood vessels that run in the arachnoid space, um, so subdural. Uh, there's blood vessels that run epidural outside the dura matter, and then there's vessels that uh, run deeper into the gray matter, and that's intracerebral. Um, due to the structure of the uh, arachnoid space, that spongy shock absorption feature, very rarely will the patient have um, traumatic hemorrhages to the excuse me, subdural vessels and the intracerebral vessels. It's possible, but those tend to be far more likely in the um, intracerebral hemorrhage, excuse me, in the um, hemophragic stroke patients. They generally don't have a, um, I mean, it's possible to have ruptures to those vessels. But it's just not as common in your um, trauma patients and we'll see a little bit more about those here so dura matter is the outer durable thicker protective coating or protective layer moving down to the spine here we have the 33 vertebrae the five sections cervical thoracic lumbar um, sacral and coccyx sections um, remember there's seven cervical vertebrae but there's eight cervical nerves because of the way they come out above and below the last one then you have the 12, thir serv ugh, 12 thoracic vertebrae corresponding with the pairs of 12 pairs of ribs and 12 um, thoracic nerves, five lumbar, five sacrum, four coccyx. Um, so these are the two you these are the two most unique vertebrae, um, the axis and the atlas, the, uh, that sit right at the base of the skull itself at the very top, C1, C2, and they are responsible for the majority of our ability to rotate our heads around. Um, the rest of the vertebrae have a relatively limited um, rotational function. All right, so here we can see the structures of the vertebrae where you have the main vertebral body with the intravertebral discs between each vertebrae. And then uh, you see the spinal cord in the spinal canal that run or the vert vertebral canal and um, these peripheral nerves extending out from the spinal cord. Uh, the intervertebral discs are a cartilage structure. They're spongy, or not spongy, they're uh, squishy and shock absorbing. But when they rupture, they can cause pressure on the uh, peripheral nervous system, on those um, spinal nerves that are coming out of the spinal cord. And that's where you get the slip disc or the ruptured disc and that sciatic pain or wherever it happens to be along your uh, spinal column. That's where that chronic back pain often comes from pressure on the nerve root there all right so if we don't remember from anatomy and physiology the spinal cord is what senses or collects signals from the peripheral nervous system and then uh, sends reactions out to the extremities and also notifies the brain of what's going on throughout the body <clears throat> 
um, because of the function of the spinal cord, if you were to touch something hot or something painful, your spinal cord will immediately send the response back out to the extremity to move your arm or move your hand. That's a reflex. It's just automatic. You can't, uh, it's very hard for you to control that. And then it will simultaneously send the message to the brain saying, hey dummy, you just put your hand on a hot stove. That's often why you will realize you pulled your hand off of the injury or the hot spot before you registered in your brain that it was hot. It's because your spinal cord recognized this was a hot surface and you shouldn't have your hand there and you pull it away first. Then you realize, oh, that hurt. So the spinal cord itself ends in the upper lumbar area and below that point, it's a bunch of nerves that hang down and then go out through the sacrum and the lumbar of between the lumbar vertebrae and out of the sacrum and all that and run down to your legs and they dangle kind of like a horse tail does and so that's why it's called the quadra equina equina equine horses so quadra equina the quadra being a collection of nerves um and they're all hanging at the bottom of the spinal cord uh the doesn't show a good picture of that here. All right, so we've talked about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, all parts of the autonomic nervous system. They are controlled heavily through the spinal cord um, because they are autonomic, because they are not something that we have to consciously consider. All right, so here's some MOIs. I think we've kind of covered this the other day as MOIs that would need spinal motion restriction. So we're gonna move through that. Again, whenever dealing with head injuries and spinal cord injuries, airway breathing circulation takes precedence. Airway breathing circulation always takes precedence over the spinal cord injury, but the presence of a head injury can often indicate that the pre patient is less likely to be able to control their air own airway and breathing and therefore are going to need a greater amount of intervention there. It's things that we want to uh, anticipate, problems that we should be expecting. All right. Um, so, yeah. Nothing new. Uh, nothing surprising or unexpected all right so hyperventilation in head injuries for years this was taught that oh if their patient has a head injury you should hyperventilate them in order to lower their intracranial pressure does hyperventilation lower intracranial pressure well it can but what caused the intracranial pressure in the first place and why do we have it well let me let, let's talk about this for a few minutes intracranial pressure is built up by three major functions within our um cranium we have good grief all right so we have inside our cranium we have the brain Crap. We have the CSF, not the CSP, CSF, and blood. Okay? These three structures or these three items are what makes up our brain, are the uh, contents of our cranium. If you increase the quantity of brain, you're going to have to decrease your blood or your CSF. If you increase the quantity of blood, you're going to have to decrease the CSF because you can't you can't decrease the quantity of brain. The brain is there, but you're going to squeeze it. All right? So the brain will get squeezed. And vice versa, if you increase the CSF, you're going to have to decrease your blood or increase uh, or squeeze your brain because it can't, um, it, its volume can't be changed or removed. So 
when we have trauma, often, like a head trauma or something like that, oftentimes you're going to have an increase of blood. Because of a ruptured artery, artery or something like that, you'll have an intracranial hemorrhage. You increase the uh, blood quantity, you start putting pressure on the brain. There's also a decrease of oxygen uh, delivery due to this pressure and due to this bleeding. And so what does that cause? Inflammation, <laughs> excuse me, hypoxia. And so fluid's gonna shift into the neurons and into the brain tissue, ca causing it to swell. So now your brain quant um your brain contents are getting larger. This is going to result in a pushing of the hydro of the cerebral spinal fluid out of the, the cranium, but ultimately only so much of it can move. So you'll reduce the amount of fresh blood moving into the cranium, you'll reduce the amount of CSF in the cranium, and you're going to start swelling your brain tissue. Because the cranium is a solid, rigid structure in adults and most children, you can't stretch it. You're not going to, there's no pressure relief or anything like that. What this leads to is an increase in intracranial pressure, an increase in ICP. As your ICP goes up, then the amount of blood pressure in your body that's required to push blood into your brain um, it is going to go up as well. Now. What are, what are we talking about? How do we work, work that out? Well, we all remember systolic and diastolic, and we're familiar with our mean arterial pressure, also known as our MAP. Well, if you take your MAP and you subtract your intracranial pressure, you know, the amount of pressure that's already in the cranium, you get what's called your CPP, or your cerebral perfusion pressure. This is the amount of blood pressure that's bringing blood into the brain, delivering oxygen to the tissue. So when your MAP is staying relatively the same, but your ICP went up, then your cerebral perfusion pressure is going to go down, meaning less blood is going to get carried into that brain. The brain will be less perfused, less oxygen. This will mean more hypoxia, more brain swelling, and so on and so forth, which is only going to increase your intracranial pressure higher, resulting in a lower CPP, cerebral perfusion pressure, as we can see here. And this results in this big circle of death, not the circle of life, where, you know, the ICP goes up, which causes the CPP to go down, which causes the map to go up, which causes the IC, um, the tissue to swell, and um, and that results in the IP um, the ICP going up again, which causes the CPP to go down, and it just spirals until the patient ends up dying of too much pressure in their brain. So that's the the cycle here now this is why if you've ever heard like they say well we don't want to treat blood pressure in the field because the patient might need that high blood pressure well as their inter intracranial pressure is increasing the only way to maintain adequate pressure in your uh, perfusion pressure in your brain is to increase your mean arterial pressure that mean arterial pressure has to go up and the only way to do that is to increase your um your bp so the increased BP means a higher MAP, which means a better cerebral perfusion pressure, but that also means more blood's forced into their brain. If they're bleeding, that's going to cause more um, swelling, more pressure in the skull, and that's where that whole process comes from. This is why doctors are often very cautious to lower a patient's blood pressure when they're suspected of a stroke, because that elevated systolic blood pressure may be only, the only thing keeping perfusion in that brain. So now that we kind of looked at where what's going on inside the skull, why are you know where's the hyperventilation do? Well, if we hyperventilate the patient, breathe faster than for, um, ventilate them faster than they need to be, they're going to blow off CO two. So there's hyperventilation causes. A decrease in CO2, 
and an increase of O2. When you decrease CO2 and increase the O2, the vessels are like, well, we, we've got all the oxygen we need. We don't need more blood flow in here, so we're going to constrict. So what it causes is a vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction will reduce the amount of blood, so a decrease in blood flow or blood volume. This means a lowering ICP, and that will, um, and that's the kind of the goal that we're looking for. But if we vasoconstrict and we reduce the amount, then we're going to reduce the amount of blood flow into the brain. We're going to reduce the amount of oxygen that can be carried into the brain, and that can result in a hypoxic injury, especially in the areas that have already been damaged or had trauma. It also will increase the likelihood of the patient having a um, additional swelling and things like that throughout their brain. So while hyperventilation will reduce ICP, it can also result in hypoxia. And so we only want to use it under the most extreme circumstances and in that and in still we want to use it very sparingly and controlled. So instead of focusing on your ICP or excuse me your hyperventilation from a rate standpoint, Focus on your hyperventilation from a CO2, an end tidal CO2 level. You know, we want a normal end tidal CO2 to be 20, um, 35 to 45. Well, when we hyperventilate that patient, we might be shooting for a CO2 of 25 to 30. So we're reducing their uh, end tidal CO2 a little bit, but we're not doing it uncontrollably or um, excessively. This should only be done when you have those unequal pupils, profound altered mental status, their GCS um, is low or has dropped significantly, there's good evidence of a um, head injury, you have posturing, things like that. That's when you're going to want to do this hyperventilation. It's kind of a last ditch effort because you're, you're risking dam permanent damage to brain cells through hypoxia. And so we want to reserve that for the very last possible option. So um, hyperventilation based on end tidal CO2 shooting for 25 to 30 uh, millimeters per mercury. All right, so, well, yeah, spinal cord injuries, head trauma that doesn't have a pulse, you would start CPR assuming that's your only patient and it looks like it's a survivable injury. Uh, the concern here about scalp lacerations are, uh, or excuse me, uh, pressure on scalp wounds is what caused the laceration and what's the chances there being a skull fracture underneath of that laceration because you don't want to be pushing um, bone fragments into the brain matter. All right. Um, look for sensory loss when doing your head to toe assessments on these patients. Um, Skin that is warm, dry, and flush after trauma is not normal. Normally after trauma, you have pale, cool diaphoretic if they're shocky or something like that. So if they've suffered a significant trauma and their skin is pale, cool, and diaphoretic in their arms and neck and chest or upper part of their chest, but then their abdomen and legs are warm and dry and flush, that's a really good indication you have a spinal cord injury. And uh, you wanna be really careful about uh, the way you transport and move the patient in that sense. And there have been some circumstances where I've elected to fly potential spinal cord injuries like this because I knew the roadways that I was going to have to get uh, travel across to get from where I was to where the patient needed to be. And I knew that putting them in a helicopter would be uh, more protective of their spine than uh, bouncing down the interstate on a uh, backboard and an ambulance that has poor suspension. When you suspect spinal cord injury, it is really important that you start fluids early. You do not want to wait for the blood pressure to bottom out or anything like that, especially um, 
especially with the spinal cord injury, they may already have started losing that blood pressure, but you've got to get fluids in there so you can refill this now dilated lower portions of their body. Elevating their feet, that whole shock position thing can also be really helpful for it uh, and for controlling that um, blood pressure. There was teaching for years. So if you went to EMT school, you know, like 15, 20 years ago or something like that, you may have heard the teaching that, oh, we don't want to give large quantities of fluids to patients who have had inj head injuries because we're just going to cause them to bleed faster and cause more problem in their brain. Well, it's really not the case because brain being a closed container will only accept so much blood. And what's really more important for that patient is an adequate map maintained by the fluids and by the blood pressure and not holding fluids. So now we want to treat a hypovolemic or hypotensive patient the same whether they have the head injury or not. But be cautious with dextrose. Um, D50 and uh, definitely not, but uh, probably avoid D10 and things like that because if they have a brain bleed or spinal cord hematoma or something like that and that high glucose concentration or dextrose con concentration fluids make it to that tissue, they could cause um, necrosis to that uh, damaged nerve tissue very easily. Okay, so another option for your brain, um, your spinal cord trauma patients is you might need to do vasoactive medications um, where you're like, like a dopamine drip or an epi drip in order to cause vasoconstriction, but you might also need to use um, atropine in order uh, to block the vagal nerve stimulation and increase heart rate that way. Um, if you're if you're at a point in time where you're having to vent, hyperventilate your patient to decrease intracranial pressure, then you're going to want to hold your fluids and be cautious about that. But prior to that, give the patient fluids, maintain adequate perfusion. All right, so disability and exposure, this is a matter of monitoring what or determining what their mental status is, what what is their level of responsiveness, and what is their baseline normal. Um, for most patients, for most adult and pediatric patients, we're not really that, we don't really seem to have to worry about that as much because we kind of assume they have an, a baseline normal to most persons in society. However, when we get into the elderly, um, you know, like in nursing home residents and things like that, it becomes more important to worry about what is their baseline normal uh, and is this their history of dementia or is this their more their recent fall and possible head trauma that's causing this altered mental status? So, injuries that you want to look for in your assessment of the spinal column, you would do this early in your assessment when you log rolled the patient onto a backboard because once you've placed them on a board, you're not going to want to roll them again to assess this later. All right, so that's pretty clear, pretty straightforward, nothing new here, nothing fancy. All right, uh, yeah, we already talked about considering air transport, recognizing the patient might need surgery, so on and so forth. So there's several ways that you can get the patient um, immobilization. A scoop stretcher is not a recommended method of spinal immobilization because it doesn't um, – cover a large portion of their body and it's a lot harder to secure them to it however in a lot of circumstances if you suspect significant spinal or there's really good um likelihood or you know high suspicion of spinal cord injuries you might want to use your um scoop stretcher to move the patient onto the backboard so you would you know slide the scoop stretcher under them, lift them off the ground, put them on the backboard, and that way you could avoid the log rolling and all that possible uh, trauma that way. Yeah, nothing new here. Well, uh, except if your patient's critical and you're worried about ABCs and needing surgery, then 
Again, you sacrifice the spinal cord if necessary. If the patient's vitals are stable, mental status is stable and all that, then we're gonna do everything we can to protect the spinal cord. We all should remember, if you're gonna place the patient on the backboard, um, we have to um, pulse sensory motor function and all that kind of stuff prior to placement and then after as well. Um, now, how do we know or how do we determine if the patient doesn't need to be placed on a backboard? Well, that's a thing. It's possible. We can do spinal motion uh, restriction clearance where we approach the patient with kind of the, are you hurting anywhere in your neck or back? If they say no, um, then we're going to continue the uh, assessment to look for the possibility of injury. If they say yes, they are hurting, well, then we're going to place a C collar, put them on a backboard, and quite no more questions asked. They had complaints of pains in their neck or back. But, bef but if they say, nope, I don't have pain in my neck or back, I don't want to go on a backboard, well, then we need to, to answer a few questions. Is the patient conscious, alert, and oriented nor appropriately? Do they have any type of intoxicating substances, drug or, drugs or alcohol on board? Do they have any form of distracting injuries, you know, like maybe a broken leg or ankle or something or a, a uh, tore up Harley that, that's really bothering them that they're very concerned about and distracted by? When that's present, they may not even be thinking or considering the possibility of pain in their neck or back yet. And so we're going to collar and boarded them out of uh, precaution. Another reason or another thing we need to determine is does this patient communicate with us in our ability or excuse me, can we communicate with each other in our primary languages? If this patient is a sign language patient, we might know a little bit, but is that our primary means of communication? It could be. We could be fluent in sign language. Problem solved. But if the patient speaks broken English and is predominantly Spanish speaking, and I'm mildly Spanish speaking, we're not communicating in our primary languages and therefore there's a lot that might be lost in translation. And without having a medical translator on scene, you might not be able to get through this. So in those cases, when you can't communicate with the patient in their preferred means of communication, it's best to go ahead and secure and immobilize them out of precaution um, versus risking a misunderstanding of what was being asked and further injuries being come, uh, the result of that. I realize that I keep saying we want to prevent further injury, but earlier I did say it's very unlikely. It is. It's very unlikely that we will cause further injury, but we want to take every step possible to prevent it and to reduce that possibility. All right. Um... So once we've answered those questions, we've determined they are a reliable patient. There's no, there's no distracting injuries, no intoxicating substances, no complaints of neck or back pain, no complaint or and no in, um, no problems with communication. Then we take the flat of our hands and we start in the back of their head and we say, oh, what we're going to do is I'm going to feel down your neck and your back and you tell me if you feel pain. We're not pointing in, we're not pushing in with our fingertips. We're just going to run the flat of our hand down their neck and back gentle pressure to say, hey, is it anywhere along here that's injured or feels uncomfortable or painful or something like that? We get all the way down to their waistline. They say, nope, no pain. Okay, good. Next part of it. Having them stand right in front of us, we want them to look down and up, move their head in this direction. We want to make it clear to them that at any point in time during this exam, if they feel pain, to immediately stop moving and, and not continue to move. So they look up and down. We're good. All right, continue. Look side to side, any pain? All right, continue. And then you wanna put your ears to your shoulders. Good? All right, we have now done spinal motion restriction clearance. We don't have to put that patient on a C collar or backboard, even if they had a significant mechanism of injury because we've ruled out the likelihoods of a um, spinal cord injury. It doesn't guarantee it, but it rules it out the likelihood. If you're looking at it, you know, you know what? I 
I hear you, you're saying you don't have neck and back pain, but looking at what happened here, it's almost impossible for you not to have injuries. So we're gonna just do this out of precaution. You can still do that. Use your judgment in that situation. But if you choose to not board and collar that person, that is the pro process, that's the method you wanna to use to rule that out or to um, make that as safe as possible. And of course you wanna document all those findings. All right. Um, unfortunately, we have very little control of how long that patient is going to be on the backboard, especially with current hospital uh, diversion statuses and um, census numbers. We might be waiting for that uh, patient to get a room for quite a long time, in which case we want to see about rotating them or not necessarily rotating them, but um, relieving some of that pressure becomes a much bigger concern in the elderly. Um, many times patients have developed uh, bed sores from laying on a backboard for too long. So here you can see a couple of options that are maybe more comfortable, more tolerable from the patient, uh, for the patient. Most of the time we don't have these options available to us. Uh, we can pad a little bit under their lower back, take some of that weight off of the pelvic bones or the, and um, the shoulder blades. Because those are the places, the pelvic bone and the shoulder blades are the two, two areas that are most likely to have that pressure injury. Uh, that's the vacuum splint. Really great way. Expensive. Um, makes, uh, it takes a little special training to use it, but a very effective way to secure a person in a longboard. Here's some examples of towel placement. Um, again, I would not want to secure the patient for any period of time on a scoop stretcher, but you could use that if necessary. And I would, um, I many times used a similar method as the one on the right there to um, bend the legs and pad under the legs of a patient on a backboard. It rotates their hips just a little bit and goes a long way to easing the pressure on their lower back when they're laying um, secured to a backboard. You pad under the legs that way so you can still pull, pull adequate pressure with the belts to hold them securely to the board. People are always like, oh, don't do the two straps too tight. Okay, yes, we don't want to do the straps so tight they cannot breathe and expand their chest, but people, the straps have to be tight. If the patient is able to rock around on the board, they're not secured. They're going to move their back. Put the straps on them. They need to be snug. Think of it similar to like if you were to secure a kid in a car seat. You want them actually tighter than that because you don't want them moving. All right, history taking secondary exam is really probably not going to be much of a uh, change or anything new here. Um, most of the time we're going to complete our secondary assessment after we've already initiated transport with the exception of a detailed assessment of their back while we're immobilizing them or prepping them to go onto a backboard just to make sure we um, clear that or um, evaluate that before we um, transport them. But we're in route, let's go ahead and assess for all of these types of um, injuries. Um, why are we uh, assessing the ure urethral meatus in uh, adults who have had spinal cord or males that have had spinal cord trauma? Priapisms. You're trying to identify the presence of priapisms. Sometimes that spinal cord injury can cause nerve stimulation and dilation of the arteries. That's a great example, of, or excuse me, a really good indicator of spinal shock um, is when they have that dilation of the arteries below the level of the um, injury resulting in the uh, priapism.
All right, so we talked about intracranial pressure already a little bit. Here's a breakdown. I would be really familiar with this chart. I think that the information provided here is very helpful on recognizing the difference between mild, moderate, and um, marked or significant uh, intracerebral pre or intracranial pressure. Notice that the um, increased um, Blood pressure is very common in all of these. Of course, as it gets wi uh, higher or more severe pressure, you're gonna have a widening of the pulse pressure. The diastolic and the systolic will get further apart. Chain Stokes respirations are common in mild ICP. Central neurogenic hyperventilation looks a lot like Kuzmal's, except they just had trauma. If you remember, Kuzmal's is that rapid deep breathing associated with hyperglycemia. For a similar reason, they're going to hyperventilate that uh, central neurogenic hyperventilation, except it has nothing to do with their blood pressure and they've had recent head trauma. And then you can see marked elevation or severe increased intracranial pressure that creates the biot's uh, respiration, sometimes called ataxic respirations. This is those very in, uh, disorganized, uncontrolled, um, erratic breathing uh, that comes right before agonal breathing. But notice the other changes as well um, in the complaints. Oftentimes, though, your patients, even in mild hypervent, or, excuse me, mild elevation, are not going to be conscious enough to. Um, to answer questions or things like that. They will have an altered mental status. But like it says under there, it talks about um, headache. Well, they may have been complaining of the headache prior to going unconscious. The, the, the headache was an earlier sign of bleeding in their brain. Um, C3 through C5, or some generally is considered C4, is what innervates the diaphragm. That's very important nerve to remember. Injuries from at um, C4 and above could cause diaphragm problems. Generally, injuries below C4 are not going to cause issues with their breathing, but may cause issues with their bones and all that. The myotomes and the dermatomes, the sensation and um, muscle control regions of the body, uh, as a result of spinal cord nerve or spinal nerves, very easy to reference and look up in the field. It's not something that you need to memorize, but do remember C4, you know, it's that C3, C3 through C5 area. That's where you're going to be risking diaphragmatic um, control problems. We don't often do a full uh, assessment, neurologic assessment like this for a patient, but if they're you know, you have a non-critical patient who's like, well, I don't know if I'm okay or not. Well, let's do this. Well, look at that. You've got equal movement and function. You got great nerve control. Think you're going to be all right. You know, very similar to uh, to like an ex what you would expect to see in an extensive or drawn out stroke assessment. So here's the dermatomes. These are the sensation versus what we were seeing a minute ago was the myotomes. And as like I said, you can. Um, very quickly Google this and reference it for a uh, map of the body. So. All right, so um, what I wanna do is we'll talk a little bit about head traumas and some of the different head injuries and then we'll call it for a day. Um, TBIs, as you can see, quite a number of them each year. Um, a lot of them in uh, develop or excuse me, present to the emergency department, but you know, 2.8 million to the ED visits, but only 280,000 uh, hospitalizations in 2013. So that's a significantly lower number. That's like a 10th. So like one in 10 head injuries are going to get hospitalized. And then of those hospitalizations, that is roughly 20%, not quite 20% of them that resulted in death. So that's means that like one in 10 injuries stays in the hospital, maybe one in um, 20, um, excuse me, one in five. So that would mean, what is it? Like one in 15 in head injuries might uh, die. Uh, so that's a, or no, no, it's even less than that. I don't know why I said one in 15. It's a very low, um, why am I? 
So it's like one in every 50 head injuries could result in death. So here are where most of your head injuries come from. Falls could be anything from falling from a ladder, falling from standing, falling out of a tree kind of a thing. Motor vehicle crashes are really not that common, or excuse me, are not that high of a percentage when you look at it overall. Um, blunt or unintentional blunt trauma other than a fall. And then that other and unknown is going to be your um, assault um, as well as many other categories where um, pen or penetrating trauma of some sort. All right, closed, open. I think we should be pretty good on that one. Open head injuries are pretty obvious. Um, of course, they say that if you have cerebral spinal fluid in nose or ears, it is an open head injury. If that is the only open openness or evidence of open head injury you don't need to worry about it as much as you do like somebody who's got a gash in their skull with op um, brain matter visible because in that case the patient's a much greater risk of infection basal skull fractures that they're bleeding uh cerebral spinal fluid out of their nose and their ears is actually helpful because it means they're not going they're at a much less likely to create uh, develop un increased intracranial pressure and have all of those problems associated with that but because it's up inside their nose or in deep in their ear they're a lot less likely to um, develop a um, in brain infect an infection in their brain or inside their cranium as a result of it here we can see a scalp laceration I think we've kind of gone over these showed you a picture a minute ago or earlier about how to um, bandage a scalp wound um, you know they bleed heavily but then um, generally will stop bleeding very quickly um, of course if the patient's been consuming large quantities of alcohol there's a larger uh, possibility that they will um, uh, continue to hemorrhage and have a harder time clotting but also if the patient is um, of course has clotting factor disorders or anything like that um, oh but if the artery is involved so I did have a patient one time who you know perfect storm he's drunk right alcoholic he's drunk uh, heavily intoxicated stumbles falls and hits the side of his head right here at the temple on the corner of his coffee table and lacerates the temporal artery that you can feel right here and it is straight <laughs> It's just spraying blood all over the place. It was a straight murder scene in there. Um, you know how I controlled it? I put my finger right there on the artery. I just found that pulsating artery and compressed it with my finger, and that was how we were able to control it till we got to the local hospital. There was no putting a bandage or pressure dressing or anything like that on that wound. You just controlled it like that. It's all we could do. Um, oftentimes scalp wounds, especially on the occiput, back of the head and all that, you think you've bandaged it, you've controlled it, but because of multi-system trauma, you're putting them on a long board, securing them with head blocks and all that, and then it's not until you get to the hospital that you realize they were still bleeding down the back of their neck and it was running off under their arm into the, ha the uh, handholds of the uh, backboard and the whole sheet under the backboard is wet with blood and you had no idea it was still bleeding so make certain that you do reassess those frequently in the field while we will prioritize transport over uh thorough uh, bandaging of head wounds you want to find out if we put a bandage on it did it stop the bleeding or if they had a head wound has it stopped bleeding or how how big of a concern is that mm -hmm. All right, some skull fractures. So, of course, anytime there's enough force to cause a skull fracture, you want to anticipate the possibility of cervical spine damage uh, and cranial nerve damage, brain damage, and things like that. Ah, excuse me. So here we can see a linear skull fracture. This is where it's basically just a scratch. A crack, not a scratch, a crack in the skull. There's no dis, uh, 
depression, there's no displacement or anything like that. But it can be associated with epidural or even subdural hematomas. So there can be bleeding in the brain and increased intracranial pressure as a result. Here we have a depressed skull fracture. This is actually gonna place pressure on the tissue. This is one of the ones you wanna look for with the flat of your hand. You're feeling it with the flat of your fingers, not point pushing in, causing them to like, you know, move their arm because you put pressure at the right spot of their uh, motor cortex. You're not going to see a depressed skull fracture like this and not have some kind of neurologic alteration. You may have a patient who's conscious and alert with a linear skull fracture, but generally by the time you're getting into depressed and higher force trauma like this, they're going to have some kind of neurologic change. Now, pediatrics, young kids um, and infants, they are the common exception because their brain is not as large as their cranium and there's a lot of extra room in there so they can take a force they can take swelling they can take depressed skull fractures and stuff and not show symptoms nearly as quickly so like the kid that i showed you the picture of the screwdriver in his head in the top of his head that is a great example of he's conscious alert and oriented fully aware of everything that's going on knows he's got a screwdriver sticking out of the top of his head no altered mental status whatsoever um, just because there's more room in there um, for the swelling and uh, for the pressure kind of already talked about basal skull fractures so i'm not really going to talk about that much more here's your open skull fracture this does not mean that they are dead this does not mean that they will not recover however it is um, associated with a higher level level of mortality than other skull fractures um, the one of the biggest concerns is how much brain tissue was damaged and how much infection is going to come as a result of this trauma I just love how they decided to just put that little bit of hair uh, right around it to say, oh, look, we have some skin here. Just really kind of changes the image of what, what are we looking at? Like, wh what is that actually on the side of their head? So what do we do if our patient has a skull fracture or open or something like that? <clears throat> Of course, use the pad of your fingers, gentle uh, padding with the, you know, if it's a scalp wound and the skull appears to be intact, then you can use a pressure dressing or tr apply direct pressure to slow the bleeding. But if there's instability or depressed or open skull fractures, you want to just do careful, gentle padding of the wound so as not to force anything into the brain matter, but also to isolate it from the environment so they don't uh, develop infection. All right, so when it comes to brain injuries, this is where our role becomes really big. While we can very rarely prevent that primary injury, um, the, which is the direct trauma, whatever, you know, they fell off their bicycle and hit their head on the concrete, we can't prevent, we can rarely prevent that. We can play a role in community outreach and education, but rarely can we prevent the primary. The secondary injuries are the injuries that come as a result of the original. So if a person hits their head and they go unconscious, they vomit and aspirate. The aspiration is a secondary injury. The hypoxia to the brain because they weren't breathing is a secondary um, injury. The increased intracranial pressure and the hyperventilation and the hypoxia from that, that's a secondary injury. Seizures. Um, secondary injuries hemorrhage all of that stuff so our goal is to reduce the likelihood or the significance of the secondary injuries i identify the presence of the primary injury anticipate the outcomes and treat aggressively and quickly in order to avoid or prevent secondary injuries <laughs> now coup contra coup is when the patient is compressing the like has a sudden stop of their cranium the brain matter shifts forward because it's traveling at the same speed they were their their forehead comes to a stop their brain continues going until it hits the inside of their cranium 
then it bounces back and it could hit the back. But more often the problem is because of the way the uh, meninges, you know, the dura mater and the pia mater are attached to the brain surface and the arachnoids, it actually causes a stretching or tearing injury to the back side, so the opposite side. So you have the coup and then contra to that, opposite of that, the, the stretching injury there as well. All right, so this increase in intracranial pressure, this is what I was talking about back before, where it talks about the accumulation of blood in the skull, swelling in the brain, causing the intracranial pressure to go up. When we see, like in medical and such like this, they'll also include uh, medical conditions that cause swelling of the brain tissue or um, tumors and things like that. The trauma chapters don't get into that as much. So it's not just CSF or um, blood but um, it could be tumors or anything along those lines. So this kind of shows you in which in this graph mass would indicate additional blood volume or swollen tissue or something like that or a tumor could be a number of things so you can see the normal state and then how things will change how there will be a um, that mass might be blood outside of the vessels like a hematoma. All right, talked about herniation before a little bit. The um, pressure of or the brain being pressed down inside the foramen magnum, that would be considered herniation. Although ipsilateral, meaning one-sided pupil dilation, um, contralateral, meaning the opposite side, those can be associated even with just the nerve control um, with the earlier pressure lower intracranial pressure, putting pressure on the optic nerves at the tentorum. It doesn't necessarily have to mean it's enough that it's been squeezing out of the bottom of the foramen, but it could, and it could end up there. So we saw ICP a minute ago. We saw the chain stokes respirations, altered mental status, then neurogenic hypertent ventilation. Well, here's some other early signs. These are before chain stokes happens, before it is that severe. Vomiting is a very common uh, symptom with most head injuries, including concussions. So for a patient to start vomiting suddenly after a head injury is not uncommon. It doesn't necessarily mean they have a brain bleed or anything like that. In fact, it's a good indication that they're having a concussion because altered mental status and unconscious, uh, losing consciousness is going to be more associated with your um subdural hematomas or epidural hematomas. Are we good on Cushing's? Do we know what Cushing's triad is? Conyers, tell me what Cushing's triad is. And we're not, hmm? What's Cushing's? Cushing's triad specifically. This is going to be found with increased intracranial pressure. This is a high blood pressure, high systolic specifically, a low heart rate, and a rapid ventilation, rapid respiration. So you have the hyperventilation, the high blood pressure, and the low heart rate. Here we have decorticate and deseverate. I always remember decorticate because their arms go to the core, to the middle, deseverate is the other one. Decorticate comes first, deseverate is, is considered the more severe. All right, so uh, diffuse brain injuries. This is gonna be like your concussions um, and things like this where their brain has been jarred or shaken a little too much in the skull. You'd also see this with your um, shaken baby syndromes and such like that. So hence the um, amnesia, uh, headaches, confusion, because of the uh, diffuse damage to brain cells, they'll start swelling um, and that's why you'll have error, um, erratic movement or uh, unexplained uh, groups or problems like it's we got this over here and that over there and it doesn't necessarily make sense because various parts of the brain were injured during that um, process.
or during the injury. So concussion being the most common of these. Um, concussions can be very mild or they can be severe where the, pa the patient will have symptoms and problems are related to them for months, if not even years. Um, while they don't often come with life-threatening conditions, um, you know, like air problems with airway control, blood pressure, and things like that, they can have a huge issue on the person's uh, li life, uh, activities of daily living, ability to hold a job, family relationships, so they can have a really big impact in the long run. And then, unfortunately, there's very little that can be done for concussions. Also, unfortunately, a lot of your early symptoms of concussions are very similar to those of intracranial hemorrhages. So it's not a good idea for you to suggest to the patient, oh, well, it's probably just a concussion. You probably don't need to go see the doctor. If there's altered mental status, if there's significant confusion, if you have vomiting, if you have any symptoms of neurologic change, they should get a CT scan. They should be evaluated for the potential of a head, head injury. I mean, excuse me, a brain bleed. Second impact syndrome. This is for the patient who has had a concussion or has had repeated concussions, and each concussion makes them more susceptible to future injuries. So if they um, have that um, another head injury, they could have, it might not even seem like that significant of a head injury, but it could result in very significant um symptoms on their part because of previous trauma. So they had a couple of concussions, they, they were bad, but they never like lost consciousness or stopped breathing. Well, now they have another mild head injury and because it, it was compounded on all previous injuries, now they're unresponsive and acting like they had a major head injury, even though it was fairly mild because of the cumulate, cumulative effect of previous injuries. So this is that post, this is what I was saying could last month. I know it says three months here. I have heard of it lasting um, much beyond that. So I think this is considered to be like the minimum, at least three of these signs for three months uh, to get this diagnosis. Headaches, dizziness, insomnia, memory difficulty, very common one. And another interesting one is this intolerance of stress or emotion, this sense of being overwhelmed very easily and quickly. I've had people report that... Um, just driving in heavy traffic became more than they could handle, uh, giving them headaches and confusion and kind of presents a lot like an anxiety attack. So diffuse axonal injuries are, dif are different than concussions and contusions. Diffuse axonal injuries are when the actual nerve axons, the appendages off of the nerves, are being torn and damaged. Um, so it's shearing, tearing, and such like that. So this comes from a much heavier impact or a much more jarring uh, event. The military has seen a lot of these uh, injuries coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan over the last 20 years because of the um, advances in mine-resistant vehicles, in body armor and helmets, um, soldiers that are surviving uh, blasts, uh, from mines or IEDs and such like that or th being thrown. They're surviving these uh, forces on their body that previously those forces would have killed them otherwise, but their body armor and their vehicle protected them from dying. And so now their brain is getting rattled um, and basically creating this shaken baby syndrome in the adults. Um, so uh, yeah, these are some of your, th the very little we can do. Um, they had a head injury. Uh, they've been unresponsive for six hours or more. That that's we're suspecting diffuse axonal injury. What are we going to do? Take them to a hospital that has neurologists and maintain vital signs. Make sure they're breathing. Have an airway. All right. So contusions in the brain are like a contusion anywhere else in the body. A blunt force has caused a rupture of the microvasculature of the capillaries, resulting in um, very often a, con uh, a concurrent concussion, too many C's. They will often have a concussion at the same time. This could cause swelling, um, and it may cause temporary uh, deficits, like neurologic deficits that you would see associated with like a stroke or something. 
All right. Um, intracranial hemorrhages. There's three categories of hemorrhages that we're going to look at here um, that we're wanting to recognize. Now, we're going to see these again during PHTLS, but it the text and the tests really do want you to recognize the difference between the, the three of them. Even though we don't have CT scans or x-rays in the field, there are symptoms present uh, that they present with that are very distinct. So the epidural hematoma, this is going to be above the dura mater, between the dura mater and the skull. And so uh, if you look at this picture here, you can see it's got a very fine point at the edges of that hematoma because the dura mater was being peeled away from the skull. And so instead of diffusing out, it has very defined lines, very distinct um, shape and area that is involved with the epidural hematoma. Blows from the head, um, not often falls, but very um, heavy direct impacts to the head. The patient will typically lose consciousness instantly, come to very quickly, you know, so they black out, collapse to the ground, start waking back up pretty quick. But then while you're treating them, you know, during the transport time, you know, within a matter of minutes to a few hours maybe, but generally minutes, they start to become unresponsive again. They have a progressive, they'll, they'll complain of head pain and they'll have a progressive, um, a progression of unconsciousness to unresponsiveness in a relatively short period of time, often within the same time frame that you're treating them. This is characteristic of epidural hematomas. They're caused by a ruptured artery, and so they develop very quickly. Blunt force, initial loss of consciousness, wakes up fully oriented, complaining of a headache, complaining of pain in that area that rapidly deteriorates into altered and then unresponsive. Subdural hematomas, on the other hand, are very common with your alcoholics and your elderly. They are commonly associated with falls. These are below the dura mater. These are um, but above the um, gray matter of the brain. So it's around the pia mater below, um, but so inside the uh, meninges, essentially. If you were to look at it on a CT scan, it would have a very um, irregular pattern. It doesn't have the sharp, pretty corners and the uh, defined lines that you would see in a um, epidural. Again, your alcoholics and your elderly trip and fall, hit their head, maybe not even complaining of pain. They're like, I'm fine, I'm fine. I don't need to go to the hospital. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, one of the most dramatic examples of this, a fellow crew member ran a call to a local grocery store for an elderly man that tripped on the curb when he was walking into the store. Uh, bystander said he hit his head. Um, he denied loss of consciousness, said his head didn't hurt, said he was fine, said, leave me alone, signed a refusal, didn't want to go to the hospital. Very next shift, we, um, my crew and I, along with the same crew from the, the fall, responded to a residence behind the grocery store for a male who was having a seizure and who had fallen several days before. Turns out it's the same guy. Now, three days later, very next shift, he had been complaining of a headache, feeling nauseated, vomited, started seizing. We got there. They said, oh, he stopped seizing. He was unresponsive to pain, started seizing while we loaded him and arrested on the way to the hospital. That is a subdural hematoma. These tend to develop slowly over a matter of a few days. So they fell, and then a few days later, they're unresponsive. How do we know the difference, epidural, subdural? Epidural will go unresponsive the day of the injury. Subdural, they will go unresponsive several days after the injury. Now, intracranial hemorrhage. These are typically the ones that you find associated with your um, hemophoragic strokes. The others are possible as well. They can come from trauma, but um, like kind of like what would cause a concussion or something like that. These are deep in the brain, as you can see now towards the ventricle, maybe around the uh, um, circle of Willis or something like that. These cause a very, uh, very rapid deterioration. So the patient had the injury and then they're having a headache and rapidly deteriorating without that loss of consciousness, regain consciousness, 
unconscious again, like you did with the epidural. This person hits their head and then deteriorates quite rapidly. I had a patient, non-traumatic intracranial hemorrhage one night, called 911, said he had a headache, I need an ambulance, and then could not give them his address. He went from, I know I need to call an ambulance, I have a headache, I need an ambulance, to could not speak clearly enough to give his address in that short period of time. That's how rapidly intracranial hemorrhages will develop. Thankfully, they had a reverse 911 system and they were able to identify the residents and we responded. Um, but it was in the mountains in the middle of the night and it was snowing, so helicopters weren't flying and we were hours from neurologic centers and he did not survive because he was not able to get from the local hospital to our neuro center fast enough. He had ruptured the circle of Willis, which both of your carotid arteries um, come up the sides of the brainstem into a circular circle of vessels that's right that runs around the brainstem at the base of the skull. That way, if one carotid is occluded somehow, this other carotid can uh, perfuse the entire brain. So it's it's a um, it's like a junction of all the vessels coming in and then going through the brain. Well, he blew a aneurysm right there on that junction. So it was essential the carotid arteries were just pumping all the blood straight out of his circulation into his um, ventricles. So, um, Subarachnoid and intercerebral and subglial hemorrhage. These are hemorrhages that are, these are very similar in, um, excuse me, subarachnoid and the uh, intercerebral, very similar presentations for us in the field, not something that you're gonna need to get super worried about trying to identify. You wanna know subdural, epidural, and uh, subarachnoid or intercerebral being the same thing. Those are what you're looking for. Uh, subglial, and uh, supergalial uh, hemorrhages, this is where you get that goose egg, you know, the hematoma under the um, outside of the skull. Um, so uh, not, not near of a concern for that. How do we handle these? High flow diesel, possibly jet fuel, get them to a neurosurgeon. Do, the only reason you would go to a local hospital on these is so that you can secure an airway before transferring them to the trauma center. These patients need to go to a neurologic trauma center as quickly as possible. Their only chance of survival is to have the pressure relieved in their brain. Um, this is a do not pass go, do not collect $200 straight to a trauma center as fast as you can. In fact, I would, in, if necessary or if possible, risk having to bag the patient to the hospital over the delay of going to the local facility to get the RSI. These are excellent candidates for helicopters or crews that have RSI capabilities in the field. Because once you establish that airway, all your concerns are fixed. Um, you don't have to worry about aspiration. You can maintain oxygenation. Yes, there's still the ICP problem and all of that, but fixing that airway or securing that airway is really the big priority in that case. Um, mannitol and Lasix, these are much later in the process. Very rarely are we gonna see these pre-hospital. You may be monitoring these infusions during like an inner facility transport from one hospital to another trauma center, but this is unlikely to be administered during the 911 response because these are trying to reduce your circulating blood volume by and pulling the pressure out of the brain by shifting fluid out of the brain cell, out of the interstitial, into the blood, and then your kidneys urinating that out. Of course, benzos, Versed, Valium, Ativan, whatever you need for the seizure control, and then possibly uh, your um, Sucks acetylcholine, intimidate stuff for RSI in order to control that airway. All right. So